Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is going to be our topic four video on electric potential. Uh, this should be the second asynchronous video we're going to do in this series. Uh, I just want to start by reminding you again why we're doing this asynchronously. Um, our world is changing, and with the ability to learn almost anything uh, on YouTube, I mean, there are, there are entire universities where you can get your degree online where you just watch the professor uh, teach a, a, an already made video, right? Like, you can, you can have entire classes online nowadays. Um, I might have told you the story about how um, my brother, he's a dentist, he, he's learning how to do orthodontics um, by watching videos, which is so cool. And so this is something powerful. I want you guys to tap into this while you're still in high school. The idea of being able to learn how to do something on your own. I mean, you have me for help. Obviously, I'm not trying to put myself out of the equation. You have me for help. But um, the idea is that you should be able to try to learn this a little bit on your own, asynchronously, at your own pace, at your own time. You know, the number of things that I can think of in my life that I've already learned how to do by just watching a video, uh, doing my taxes, um, my sprinklers, I learned how to do my sprinkler system by watching a video. So, I mean, yeah, this is powerful. So I really want you guys to engage in this. I want you to be ready for this. And uh, let's get started on our video. This is topic four, electric potential. And uh, what we're going to discuss today is the idea of electric fields, which we had a lesson on earlier. Um, and the idea behind a field, remember, is a way of trying to describe action at a distance. The idea that, that charges are getting pulled by a force, but the field is a way of trying to describe that force. It's, what's, um, it, it, it's the cause of the force. And we like to draw fields based on what a positive test charge would do. And so if a positive test charge, if they were, say, an unknown charge over here, well, this unknown charge, if there was a positive test charge over here, if we drew a field line towards it, this would be a field line here, then we would then know that this unknown x value, it must have been negative, because positives would want to become attracted to negatives. So the way we would draw the field around this x would be to draw all of the lines towards it, because it must be a negative. And it's important to keep in mind that this positive charge, there actually wasn't one there. We're just talking about what it hypothetically would have done if there was one. And so that's what I want to talk about in this video right here. We're going to talk about voltage, which is another name for electric potential. And we've got two plates, two parallel plates. And if you know some chemistry, you may know that these are often called the anode and the cathode, the positive and the negative plates. And if you have two plates right here and apply a voltage between them, we should be able to tell which way the field lines would be going. All right, so remember, a field is what a positive would do. So there's really two options. Let me just draw two possibilities. You could either draw it going from cathode to anode or from anode to cathode. And we're, and we're not talking about what electrons would do uh, in some sort of wire. We're discussing the field between these plates, what's going on in there. And so remember, it's a positive test charge. So would a positive test charge want to go away from positive towards negative? Or would a positive test charge want to go away from negative and towards positive? And hopefully that's kind of rhetorical. Hopefully you recognize that well, positives want to repel other positives. So all of these lines that you're seeing right here that are these dashed lines, they are implying a field. And in general, fields are intended to be straight lines. But around the edges, they do start to go in kind of a curved motion right here. You can kind of see that the field does kind of change. But in general, there should be a uniform field. I'm going to write that in here. There should be a uniform field, which is always the same consistency. So I believe we learned that E with an, a vector arrow over it, this is the symbol for a field. Uh, there would be a uniform field within these two plates right here. And uh, we would actually even be able to describe areas of what we call high potential or low potential. Okay. So I want you to kind of think for a second before I reveal the answer in this video, but where in this diagram do you imagine there would be something with high potential? And where in this diagram would there be something with low potential? So just think about that or pause for a second. Okay, well, here's the answer. The high potential area is right here. Here's where you have high potential for your field. If we're talking about a proton, there's high potential right here because it wants to get away from this positive, right? But right here, there would be an area of low potential if we're talking about a proton again, right? Potential. And the reason why this is low potential is once the positive proton, the hypothetical proton, gets to this plate over here, well, then there's, there's nowhere else for it to go. It's reached its destination. And so it's going to have the most potential, potential, not even sure if you can see that all that well, but the high potential will be here and the low potential is there. 
And what I've got written here is that this is where things are, again, similar to previous forces and fields we've discussed. This is similar to gravity. Right? If I were to discuss what gravity looks like, say, on the new slide here, right, the idea behind gravity is that if I were to hold just a random object above the ground, like just say uh, a textbook, right, where does the object have high potential? Well, up here it has high potential. And on the ground it has low potential because it can't really fall any further than the ground, right? Like that's as low as it gets. And so as the ball, or sorry, as the book moves, it moves from high to low. Right? Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, so here's another picture that kind of describes the same thing. You can see here was the high potential energy. Now the diagram is reversed. Now the positive is on the top and the negative is on the bottom. But the same thing applies. Here you have the high potential energy. Here you have the low potential energy. And when we are discussing this concept, uh, there's many different synonyms we use, but the, the term I need you to know is right here. The change in energy, specifically electrical energy, because we're taking a charged particle and moving it, we have a name for that. We call it voltage. And hopefully you're familiar with voltage from other classes. We learn about it in grade 9 science. You also learn about it in chemistry 30 if you've taken that class. And so voltage has a few different names. We can call it potential difference. We can call it electric potential. Sometimes we call it electric potential difference. Of course, we couldn't just give it one name, but they all refer to the same thing. The idea of an object having potential and then wanting to move. Now, there is a difference, though, between what you probably learn about in chemistry and what we're going to talk about in physics. In physics, we're going to talk about the potential between two charged plates, whereas usually when we're just discussing a battery in, uh, or, or a cell in chemistry 30, you're discussing the idea of an electron moving through a wire, and the electrons moving through the wire always go from the anode to the cathode. And so the direction of electron flow would be this way here. Now, that would be if you're running an external wire, but that's not really what we're discussing here. We're not talking between these two plates what's going to happen. So. so I've got another picture here, but what I want to talk about in this picture here is the idea about how if there is a field, well, a field causes a force, right? Now, fields are not forces. Fields are not forces, but... A field is one of the ways that we try to visualize and describe a force. Make sure you're clear. F, which is measured in newtons, is the symbol for force. But E, which is electric field strength, which has a few different newtons, we, a few different units we can utilize. Uh, e is a, um, a, a different measure entirely. Now, they're both vectors. Direction matters for both of them. Um, so I should even put a little arrow hat on top of this one, too. But they are, they're, they're different, but they're similar. And what I want to point out in this diagram here is what if you had, say, an electron, like a negative particle, and it was fired in a nice horizontal direction, right? Well, if it wasn't for the field causing a force to occur, right? Well, what would happen is this electron would just want to keep going on its merry way in a straight line. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is we need to discuss our big picture physics principles. And so right now, this particle would probably be undergoing what we would call uniform motion, right? Where it's, it's just going in its nice straight line, right? However, as soon as it enters this region right here, well, in this region right here, there's a new force being applied. If I were to draw a free body diagram, the free body diagram of the electron out here would be nothing. There is no force acting on it. I know it's traveling in this direction, but there's not actually a force acting on it. It's just traveling that way. However, take that same electron and put it right here. And now the free body diagram involves a force trying to go this way. And this is probably the best way of trying to describe the difference between force and field, is that the field is actually pointing upwards. We have designated a field as what a positive proton would do. We just had to pick something to go with. Um, I wonder whether it even has something to do with how um, uh, what was his name? Ben Franklin decided to just randomly go with one as positive, one as negative when he decided to figure out what his, uh, his electrical fluid was. And so we've just randomly decided that positives are what we're going to define a field as. And so the field is pointing upwards, but because this is a negative electron, the force on the electron is actually going to pull it downwards. And so although at this point we had uniform motion, at this point over here we have number two, which is accelerated motion which is a non-uniform motion. And so I believe this is principle zero, but as soon as you get inside the field, now principle one takes place. 
but actually both are taking place. Yeah, let me say that again. Both are taking place because you have some motion going in the downwards direction, but you still have motion making you go in the side to side direction. And that's why this shape right here is parabolic. It's really, it's kind of the same. It's no different than what you hopefully learned about in say physics 20, where if you were to take, um, take an object and say this is a desk, this is a desk, really crude desk here. And you were to take an object and you were to slide the object off the desk, hopefully you know that it would kind of follow that sort of trajectory path. This has that same thing. So there's a lot of overlap in the types of questions we could solve. So before we get to those questions, I need to introduce to you a new formula though. Uh, we've been talking about in the last couple slides the idea of these plates that can cause a potential difference. And the word we give for that is voltage. Voltage is your potential difference. Uh, but the formula we use for voltage in this course is going to be the change in energy per charge. Now we've already discussed the idea that energy is really important, right? Because these particles, as they're in here, they're going to undergo a, a change in energy. There used to be a, a high amount of energy right here, or at least high potential. Right? There's high potential right here, and there's low potential here. But, I mean, if you're undergoing a change in potential energy, if potential energy is decreasing, then wouldn't your kinetic energy increase? If your potential energy is going to go down, then your kinetic energy is going to increase. And so we can calculate changes in energy and use that to calculate our voltage if we know the charge of the object that is being moved. And so one of the units that we use for volts is uh, joules per coulomb, because energy is measured in joules and charge is measured in coulombs, but that's kind of an awkward one to utilize, and so one of the more common ones we use is called the Volt, which is named in honor of Alessandro Volta, who's uh, usually credited as one of the first people to make a battery. Um, I've got a few things to point out on this slide here. I mean, I, I don't read every single thing off my slide. You guys can read. Um, but one of the two things I want to point out is to know that voltage is a scalar quantity. There is no direction to it. Okay? The field has a direction. The forces involved have a direction. However, the voltage itself does not have a direction, just so you're aware. And uh, the next thing to point out, and this is one of the dumbest things that we do in physics, but unfortunately it's kind of convention now, is that if you ever see E written like this, this refers to energy. But if you ever see E written like this, it now means field strength. And it is super unfortunate that when they were trying to pick letters to represent, like variables to represent different concepts, that, I mean, we have 26 letters in the alphabet and we sometimes even use Greek letters, um, but at some point they needed to double up. And so energy is sometimes capital E, without a vector, and field strength is capital E with a vector. By the way, little e is an elementary charge. So, I mean, they're all e's. Make sure you're very careful knowing what is what when you're using formulas. So, uh, I had a picture here that kind of describes uh, the concept again of voltage, because um, I want you to know the difference between voltage and current. Okay, uh, These are things that are often used as synonyms, but they are not the same as each other. There is a difference, and we actually have formulas for both. Uh, we just did the voltage formula. Voltage is how much energy you have per charge. So that's change in energy per charge. There's a formula on your um, data table, which I don't think I have written out in these notes, but I is the symbol for current, and current is how many charges move per second. And so they are similar, but they are different. And um, you probably have seen current and voltage used if you took Chem 30. The idea of, in Chem 30, you discuss about how there's high potential and low potential here, but here we're talking about the electrons moving around a circuit. That is a little different than when we have a positive and negative plate, and we put a, a particle, well, I should make that one negative, a positive and a negative plate, and we put a particle in between them, and, it has, and it's going to go one way or the other. There is a bit of a difference there. Okay. What I need you guys to know is the difference, though, between voltage and current. And so I've got an analogy that I like to use to describe voltage versus current. And so you may, may feel like you want to write some of these down here. Um, the idea behind voltage is it's how much energy something has. And so the analogy we sometimes use is a water tank. If you had a water tank and that water tank was way above the ground, like say this height here was like 100 meters, then if water were to start leaking out of the tank, it would have a lot of energy by the time it hit the ground. 
because it has a long lot of distance to fall, and so therefore the change in energy would be quite great. And so therefore a water tank that's way above the ground would have what's known as a high voltage in this analogy. However, let's say that the water tank wasn't that high above the ground. Let's say that it was only one meter above the ground. Well, now it doesn't really have as much energy. Now if water falls out, I mean, yeah, it's going to gain energy as the leak in the water tank occurs, but there's not as much energy involved, not as much change in energy. Okay? So that's voltage. Current really focuses on this location right here. It's the, it's the size of the, uh, the hole that's spewing water. And so let's say you had a flow rate of one milliliter per second versus a flow rate of 100 milliliters per second. Well, that would be current. If you have like a drip, 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 really slow dripping, even though it could be falling a high distance or a low distance, if it's only coming out at a slow rate, that's, that's like an analogy for current, where it's not traveling, there's not that many things moving. There's very few water molecules moving. But if you have a flow rate of 100 milliliters per second, water is just gushing out of this thing, right? And so you really have then kind of four scenarios. You could have high or low and high or low. Um, so how would we do this here? You could have high current and high voltage. You could have, oh, I didn't do this very well. Let's try that again. I know I can make this. It's like a Punnett square in biology. You could have uh, high voltage or you could have low voltage. You could have high current and you could have low current. There, I think this works better. And so in terms of how this would work, if you have high voltage and high current, so if you were in this location here, it means that there's a huge change in energy and there are many particles moving. Now, the analogy for particles for us is there's a lot of electrons or protons moving. Right? The formula for current was the amount of charge per second. So the more charges you have moving, the more current you have. But if they're not moving very fast, then you could be in this category here. This would be where you have high current but low voltage. So like, let's say you have a lot of charges moving, but they only have to fall this far because there's not a lot of energy being gained. That would be high current, low voltage. Um, low current, high voltage would be where it's going drip, 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 like it's barely leaking out of this water tower. The electrons, like there's hardly any electrons moving. But the ones that do move, they have a huge energy change. They undergo a huge transition in energy change, but there's not many of them moving. And then finally, low voltage, low current means that there's not many and they're not even moving fast. Now, another analogy that I like to give, and, and I show this one to my grade nines because they find this very visual. And so this is one of the downsides to doing this video over the internet is that you can't see the visual. But um, imagine a scenario, I take my grade nines out into the hallway and I just have them be, I have them pretend to be particles. They're all charged particles. And what I have them do is I have one kid run down the hallway. But that would be the scenario where there's low current but high voltage. Then I have the whole class run down the hallway. Well, that would be high current, high voltage, because there's many of them and they're moving fast. Then I have the whole class walk down the hallway. Well, there's a lot of current because they're all in motion, but there's not a lot of energy change taking place. And then finally I have one student walk, and that would be low current, low voltage. So just to summarize, hopefully this makes sense because I want to move on. If you have lots of particles moving, you have more current. But if they're gaining higher speeds, you have more voltage. Now I have uh, another slide here that kind of represents some of the similarities between like the water flow analogy and the electricity. But if it's okay by you, unless you have questions, um, come ask me and pause the video. Otherwise, I want to get on to some of the math examples we have here because that's a big part of the lesson today is to do the math. And that, that's why I like to do this video asynchronously, is that I can, I can explain the theory usually to the whole group, but as soon as, there's, uh, as, soon as we start having uh, a lot of math calculations, usually that's when kids want to speed up or slow down. So let's start with about as simple of an equation as we can have. Uh, it says a 3.4 Coulomb charged object gains some energy as it moves through a field. Determine the voltage. Well, I mean, this is literally the formula we have. The voltage is the change in energy over the amount of charges being moved. And so your energy was 2.6 E3 joules. And the, the charge matters because if you have a, a higher charged particle, 
then it's, it's it, you have to like compare on even grounds, right? If I bring a one charged object, plus one charged object, and you bring a plus five charged object, well, we know the plus five charged object is going to encounter more, right? Like we know that there's a relationship between how much charge there is and, and force and field. So that's what this does is it accounts for that and it finds like a ratio. So uh, long story short, we just need to divide these numbers. This is uh, about as entry level as it gets. So I've got uh, 765. I only get two sig digs, so let's call this 7.6 times 10 to the 2. And one of the units is uh, joules per coulomb, or if you'd like to, make it a volt. So the number I actually got was 764.7. Uh, but when you uh, round that to two sig digs, it's 764. It only rounds up to 7 7.6. Okay, that's a pretty easy example. Um, you're not going to get questions like that very often, but that's just kind of a starter one. Now, one of the points I want to make out, um, try to make here, is that um, measuring things in volts is actually not necessarily a useful unit. Um, or sorry, measuring things in joules is actually not usually a useful unit in physics, believe it or not, especially when talking about microscopic particles. Because we're often talking about charges that are subatomic particles, like electrons. And so often when we actually calculate um, these things here, the amount of energy they have is usually quite small. Um, now, collectively, if you have lots of them, they have lots of energy. But if you're talking about one or two particles moving just by themselves, individually, there's not much of an energy change. So there's another unit of energy I need you to know, and it's called the electron volt. And this is a bit of a misnomer for the name. A lot of people think, oh, electron volt, that is a voltage. It is not. An electron volt is a measure of energy, and it is the energy required to move an electron with a volt of energy. So if you have one volt of energy and you have one electron, it's an, it's an electron volt. Uh, it's a very similar concept to light years, if you've heard of that before. A, uh, a light year is actually a measure of distance. It's how far light travels in a year. And so sometimes people hear year and they think, oh, light year, that's how much time it takes. But a light year is actually a distance. An electron volt is not a voltage, it's energy. And so basically the concept is that if you had one electron working with one volt, well, that would give you one electron volt. And uh, the way that the, uh, the math kind of works out here is that an electron has an elementary charge of 1.6 to the minus 19. And if you times that by one volt, this is crazy, but if you take 1.6 to the minus 19 and times by 1, you get 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And this is actually a conversion that's on the back of your data sheet. They probably didn't have to put it there, but it's nice to know that an electron volt is this many joules of energy. And so sometimes we'll be asked to convert between joules and electron volts, and all you need to know is this number as a ratio. So let's try an example here. We're going to try to figure out the number of electron volts needed to move an alpha particle through this potential difference from a negative to a positive plate. Now, I thought this was a good time as any to introduce alpha particles. Um, I'm not sure whether you learned about them in physics 20 or not, but an alpha particle is represented with this symbol right here, and it often has a 4 and a 2 in front of it. It is effectively helium's nucleus. So if you've heard of helium before, helium has two protons, it generally has two neutrons, and it normally has two electrons. And it's often a very stable atom, but it's actually possible to rip those electrons off. And what you would actually have is a helium ion. Uh, in chemistry, though, we don't really refer to helium as being an ion because it's actually in the noble gases. And so we kind of lie to you and say, no, helium, it's stable. It doesn't lose its electrons. And that's a lie because it does. Uh, helium is more than capable of losing its electrons. It's just when it does that, we call it an alpha particle which means it has a charge of 2e positive, because what it has is two protons, because it no longer has its electrons, right? It used to have two electrons, and it's lost them. So this is an alpha particle. It's on your data sheet. It's got a charge of two elementary charges, and here's a mass, just in case you need the mass. So our question now is to calculate the number of electron volts needed to move the alpha particle through this voltage. So let's use our formula. The, uh, the change in energy over the charge would be equivalent to the voltage. That's the new formula we've learned. But we know that if we're looking for electron volts, if we're looking for electron volts, that's actually a measure of energy. So if it's a measure of energy, I need to rearrange this formula for E equals V times Q. 
And so all I need to do is know the voltage times the charge, but I don't want the charge in coulombs this time, because normally we put charge in coulombs. In electron volts, we want to know how many elementary charges we have. So all we need to do is take our voltage, which was uh, 7.6 times 10 to the 2, and we have to multiply by our elementary charge, which we have two elementary charges. Now, some people, maybe they don't like that at first, so I want to show you an alternate method. What you could do is say, well, what you really have is you have 2 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19s. And if you did this, you would get an answer that would be in joules. Okay? Because if you took your voltage and times by two elementary charges, this would be in joules, that this would be joules per coulomb, or sorry, this would be, uh, yeah, joules per coulomb, this would be how many coulombs you have. The coulombs would cancel, you'd get an answer in joules. But then if you wanted to convert back to electron volts, you would then just have to divide by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, which isn't that kind of silly because we just times by it right here. So the shortcut to answering this one would be just to just times it by 2. Right? So if you just take 7.6 times 10 to the 2 and times by 2, we'll have our answer. So 7.6 times 10 to the 2 times by 2, and I got 1520 which will be 1.5 times 10 to the 3, and that'll be how many electron volts we need. Okay. Now, in case that lost you, because that's a big step there, let me go back in my recording here. I just want to point out that this is how we solved it in the original place, is we said that uh, one electron in by a one volt is one electron volts. Well, we really have two protons with, uh, what was it, 7.6 times 10 to the 2 volts. So really, this math is kind of still the same there. I just took two protons times by that, and that's how many electron volts you'd have. You could convert using this ratio, but it's, um, yeah, it's a, lot, it's a waste of time. So hopefully that made sense. I'm going to move on to the next example. Uh, stop me, though, if I lost you on that one. So um, on the next example right here, um, what we've been asked to do is to kind of put together some formulas. And this is really a common thing where we don't normally just take one formula and just give you a question on that and say, here, do some algebra. You know, um, physics 20 involves a little bit of that, but physics 30 is much more of a, you know, use this to get this, to get this, to get this. So try to follow along in this particular uh, thought process. We know that work is force times distance. But using the work energy theorem, work could be a change in potential energy because we know that the change in energy is the work done. So if work is force times distance, but work is energy, then your potential energy change could be force times distance. But we also knew that voltage over your change in energy was charge, or sorry, voltage is change in energy over charge. So if this is your change in potential energy, you could shove FD right there and make a new formula that goes V equals F times D over Q. And we can kind of like rearrange this a little bit and make V equals not FD together, but like separate the F and the D a little bit. And the reason we do that is that we learned last day that the field strength is F over Q. And so if you can see that right here, we have F over Q. Well, if we know that E is equal to F over, over Q, we have a brand new formula, V equals E times D. And this is the one that confuses kids a lot because we just learned that V is equal to change in energy over charge. And now we have a second formula for voltage, but this one involves field strength. The stupid idea where E is both um, energy, but it can also be a field strength depending on whether that little arrow vector is on top of it. So uh, we usually rearrange this formula though and uh, divide by D on both times, both sides and get this formula here. If you wanna figure out a field strength, the field strength is your voltage over your distance. And well, what does it mean by distance? Well, I want to go back in some pictures here, because we haven't talked about this yet. But um, here, this, this one will work right here. There is a voltage between these two plates, but there is also a distance between them. And wouldn't you agree that just like with gravity, the further that something has to travel, that makes a difference, right? If it has to travel one meter or two meters or 20 meters, that's going to change its energy. So the distance between these plates actually has an effect on how much that field was between them. When we talked about field, the field would be pointing this way, be pointing down. Because the field is what a positive proton would do, and so a positive proton would go down. So we know there's a field between these plates, but the field is actually based on the distance. 
So let me go back to where I was because I'm kind of skipping around here. But the formula we have is that your field is based on voltage and distance. And if we're talking about relationships, if you increase the voltage, you would then increase your field. Right? Turn up the voltage, you know, give it more power kind of concept. Well, you'd have a bigger field. But what if you increased your distance? Well, this would be a reciprocal relationship, an inverse relationship. If you up your distance, it would actually reduce your field because it's further away. The plates are further away from each other, and so the field can't be as strong. Right? Imagine you have two plates that are really close to each other or two plates that are really far from each other. Though the field won't be as strong if you up the distance because like, the effect that plate positive can have on plate negative will be reduced the further away you are. Isn't that kind of the way that the force of gravity works? I shouldn't say force. Oh, I used the wrong word there. Isn't that the way that a gravitational field works? The further away two objects are, the less the field happens to work. So, okay, so anyways, here's a new formula. And I've got a little note down here. We need to make sure we're very careful. This formula right here, the one that I've just shown you, is for finding a field when you have two plates with a voltage. But there is another formula for fields that we learned in a previous lesson, which is E equals KQ over R squared. And that formula also gives you a field, but it's only when you have a point charge. So that's where I give you like a random charge and I say, draw some field lines. And you would say, okay, the field lines are gonna go away from this one because everything that's a hypothetical positive tries to go away from positives. If I were to draw a negative charge, you'd draw field lines towards it because protons, hypothetical protons, would want to go towards it. So there's a difference between this and a plate, which is negative, and a plate, with, which is positive. There's a difference in the formulas. You have to use them in the right places. So, okay, so let's try some more math examples because that's kind of the main focal point of our lesson. I have a lot of theory, but we got to do the math too. Let's say we have two parallel plates and they're 16 millimeters apart. We know the field we want, let's find the voltage. This is again a fairly straightforward question. We just learned that the voltage divided by the distance will give you the field strength. And so if we want to try to figure out, uh, I'll draw an arrow here, because we have to rearrange this formula. Uh, if we want to try to figure out the voltage, the voltage will be equal to the field strength times the distance. So it's pretty straightforward. It's gonna be 800 Newtons per Coulomb multiplied by 16 times 10 to the minus three, because if you'll note, those were in millimeters, so we need to convert that to meters to make this work. So I didn't leave a lot of room for these ones here because they're, they're fairly small questions, but just take 800 and times by 16 millimeters, and I got an answer of 12.8. So now I know how many volts is required. 12.8 volts, roughly a car battery. Okay, let's try another one here. Let's determine the work done if an alpha particle moves from the positive plate to the negative plate. Well, here we're gonna use big physics principle number four, I think it is, the work energy theorem. Work energy theorem. Because if I know the voltage, remember how voltage was equal to the change in energy over charge? However, the change in energy, energy is work. So if I'd like to calculate how much work I need to do, work will be your voltage times by your charge. Now, it depends on what units we use for energy. Um, because we're probably looking for energy to be in joules, and therefore work to be in joules, I'm going to not use electron volts, but we could. We could do electron volts. But I'm, I'm going to do it this way here. I'm going to take my voltage, which was 12.8 uh, volts, and I'm going to multiply it by the charge of a alpha particle, which is 2, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. If I do this math, I will get an answer in joules. So I'm going to do that one first. 12.8 times 2, and then times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And I'm going to get this value here with sig digs. I got 4.10 to the minus 18. So that would be the answer if you wanted it in joules. However, that's a tiny amount of energy because it's, it's one alpha particle, it's, it's not a whole lot. So sometimes the alternate way of doing this would be just to take your work, multiply by 12.8 and just literally just times by two. I'm gonna skip the elementary charge amount. And so if you take 12.8 and times by two, you get uh, 25.6. 
And this would be how much energy, which is work, you did in electron volts. So there's actually two ways of answering it. And I need you guys to be fluent in both. So this is one possibility, which is a very tiny amount. This is another possibility in a more like manageable type of unit. Okay. So uh, hopefully that made sense though, the idea of the work energy theorem. That was the big picture principle we used because that's what allowed us to change your energy out for work. Uh, the last question I need to draw a better picture for. Um, it says, is the energy going to be an increase in kinetic or potential? And I want to draw a bit of a diagram here. Uh, let's put the plates this way. Let's put a positive plate over here. Let's put a, a negative plate over here. And uh, let's, uh, what do we have, an alpha particle, it said? So the alpha particle. And it says the alpha particle is moving from the positive to the negative plate. So the alpha particle, which is right here, is going to move from the positive to the negative. Now, if you remember, an alpha particle is basically two protons. So do protons want to stay here? Well, no, they don't. They would naturally want to move that way, right? And so that work done is going to take potential energy and convert it into kinetic energy. That'll be the work done. It'll be changing the potential to the kinetic. Now, if you wanted to make that alpha particle go back the opposite way, you'd have to do the exact same amount of work, though. Right? It's just you'd have to like bring it back again. And this is how your cell phones recharge, by the way. Right? The electrons go from uh, anode to cathode, and then when you plug it into the wall, I mean, it doesn't just magically happen. Work is done to force the electrons back to start so that your battery can then discharge again. So uh, hopefully that made sense, but let me just recap right here. Was the energy an increase in kinetic or potential energy? That would have been an increase in kinetic energy because your potential energy went down because it went from the positive plate where it has high potential to the negative plate where it's going to lose its potential but in the meantime it will have gained kinetic. So, Okay, uh, let me move to another example. Like I say sometimes when I'm doing this asynchronously I can go a little faster. So if you have questions stop me and, and ask. But let's try another one here. This is an alpha particle moving between two parallel plates that are, uh, what is that, 2.7 centimeters apart, and we have a potential difference. And I'm going to ask you for the amount of force acting on them. Well, if you start considering your variables, we have a distance given to us, 0 0.027 meters. We have a voltage of 130 volts. But we're being asked to solve for force. Do we have a formula that directly relates these to each other? And, well, the answer is no. This would be a good example of how we need to start putting big picture principles for physics together and we need to start merging formulas. What I do know is that voltage over distance, if I have a voltage over a distance, that can be equivalent to a field strength. However, we also know formulas for field strength. Okay? I believe we learned in a previous lesson the formula for field strength right here. I just want to point it out here. Field strength is equal to force over charge. So through like a substitution, I also know that field strength is force over charge. So therefore, if I want to figure out that force, I just blur these two formulas together and make the formula voltage over distance equals force over charge. Well, to isolate for force, I just need to times the charge up to the other side. And there we go, we've got our answer. Voltage times charge over distance will be equal to how much force we encounter. And um, now that I have my formula that I'm ready to work with, which took a little bit of work to, to piece together, I think I know all the values I need. The voltage was 130. Now charge, I got to go back here again. The charge was um, an alpha particle. Now again, we got to consider, do we want to use the joules um, energy amount? Like are we talking about electron volts? Or are we talking about joules here? And so because we're talking about charge and we're really not solving for energy, which might be allowed to be into in electron volts, we should really go with charge being 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. I know we have that option when we work with, um, with joules versus electron volts, but since we're looking for, ch for force right here, we should just stick with coulombs. Uh, and then finally, we'll divide by the distance, which was 0 0.027. So this 120 was your voltage. This was the total charge, two elementary charges. 
and uh, this was our distance right here. Now, I don't often use units, but I want to point out that a voltage could be a, uh, a joule per coulomb, and this right here was measured in coulombs, so we can actually cancel that. But a joule can also be considered a newton meter, and since this was measured in meters, you can actually cancel the meters, and long story short, I've now proven how I got to newtons. And that's kind of important. Normally I'd say watch it again, but I'm going to just do that one more time right now because that's pretty valuable. Uh, I'll try to do it in another color. I'll even write it over top here. Volts is often measured in joules per coulomb. And charge is measured in coulomb, so that cancels your coulombs. However, joules can also be written as a newton meter. And distance is written in meters, which then cancels those meters. And lo and behold, your force is now in newtons. So now I can just type in all my numbers, 130 times 2 times 1.6 to the minus 19 divided by 0 0.027. As long as I didn't screw up my math, the amount of force we are looking for with proper sig digs, which is 2, is 1.5 times 10 to the minus 15 newtons. Which it kind of makes sense that it's that small, because our energy value, if we had solved for energy, would have been tiny, which is why we often use electron volts as another way of measuring energy. Because um, really, this was the amount of force that one, one alpha particle had. So it's not a whole lot. So. Okay. Um, again, if you have questions on that, rewind it. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Uh, in this particular question set, we're going to try to calculate the velocity of the electron. And we're going to try to use kinematics and dynamics. I'm going to try to set the scene on this one here. We are going to have some parallel plates. So I'm going to kind of draw them here. Let's make a positive plate right here. And let's put a negative plate over here. And we're going to accelerate an electron from rest. Well, if the electron's going to accelerate, it didn't tell me, but I know which plate the electron has to be starting at. Uh, the, ele the electron better be starting on this plate over here. Because if you put the electron over here by the positive plate, it wouldn't want to move. Right? So we know the electron's going to be over here by the negative plate, and that we know that the, uh, the voltage between them is a 20 volt, you know, battery basically, right? And uh, this electron is going to want to start going in this direction like this. It's going to want to accelerate. So the question we've been asked is if we have an initial velocity of zero, what final velocity will it hit when it gets way over here? And so this is another one of those classic examples where we're going to have a lot of different formulas getting merged together. Uh, I'm going to begin with what I know. I've been given a voltage and a distance. I've been given a voltage. I've been given a distance. And so with some of the formulas I know, I can calculate a field strength. I can calculate a field strength as a voltage over a distance. That's nice. Um, not that useful yet, though. But we, we did this earlier, though. Wasn't a field strength also equal to the amount of force you have over charge? So what I could do is I could kind of eliminate the middleman and make a new formula where I can say force over charge should be equal to voltage over distance. I still don't even have velocities anywhere here yet, but I can keep going. Isn't a force equal to a mass times acceleration? So that means that I could do m times a over q equals v over d. Whew, there's a lot of steps here. So force is mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. And what I could do is I could isolate this for the acceleration. So if I isolate for acceleration, it would be voltage times charge all over distance times mass. I'm going to bring Q up. I'm going to bring M down. And I've now found a formula that would tell me how much acceleration this particle would have. That was the dynamics part of this. It said use dynamics. I did. I used a force equaling mass times acceleration. If I am losing you, stop this video and ask for my help. Because um, we're still not done yet. We now know that we can calculate the acceleration. We have all that information. But if you're trying to use kinematics and you're looking for velocity final, we need to know more. Like, for example, we need to know velocity initial is zero, which is good. I'm getting closer. I still need one more piece of information, though, to make this work. But the good news is I know that. I know a distance, because I believe it told me a distance that it's going to travel. If the plates are four centimeters apart, I actually know the distance between these two plates is four centimeters. I know how, much, I know how far 
it's going to go. So I actually get to use distance twice, <sighs> which means I need to use the kinematics formula Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2ad. And I'm isolating this for the final velocity, which means I need to square root both sides, which means I need velocity final to be the square root of velocity initial squared plus 2ad. But wait, I know the acceleration. The acceleration was actually equivalent to vq over dm. Now, I also knew velocity initial was zero, so I don't even really need that number. I can omit that entirely. So I now have put together a formula for velocity final. It will be two times v times q over d times m. So that's me replacing acceleration. And then I times by d again. And I love showing it this way here because something really cool happens. You actually discover that you did not need the distance. And this comes back to something I discussed right at the very beginning of the lesson, is that the amount of field strength really doesn't make a difference. Like the distance between the plates, it is a uniform field here. There is a uniform field between here. The field is the same strength regardless of where you're at. If you're here or here or here, the field is actually the same amount either way. And so the distance actually didn't even matter. So I'm now ready to solve this. I need to go 2 times my voltage, which was uh, 20 volts. I have to times by my charge which was one elementary charge, so 1.6 to the minus 19, because it was an electron. And then I have to divide by its mass. Now, I don't know that we've used this yet, but the mass of the electron is on your data, data sheet. So maybe pause the video for a second and find the mass of the electron on a data sheet. Um, look on the back side, not on the formula side, but on the back side. And uh, maybe you're familiar with it, so hopefully you found it by now or you've paused. But the mass of the particle in question was the mass of an electron. It is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. And this is not the only way you can solve it. In theory, you could have solved for every single variable along the way. A lot of students like to solve for like the force and then solve for the acceleration. And then they like to solve for you know each little piece along the way. And if you want to use numbers, that's fine. It's not as efficient. I definitely recommend that you get comfortable manipulating formulas without actually having to type the numbers in, because then you can put all the numbers in on the last step. So I'm going to go 2 times 20 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, divide by 911 times 10 to the minus 31, and square root the whole thing, and come up with a final velocity of 2 point, okay, sig digs, I'm going to go way back up here again, 2 sig digs, 2.7 times 10 to the 6 and that would then be meters per second. So uh, like I was trying to say a second ago, if you can calculate that, but the way you did it was maybe like a little bit more like step-by-step -step process, like for example, perhaps what you did is you did V over D and you found an E. And so now you have that number, right? So you have this number and you stored it as letter A in your calculator. And then you then use the formula uh, e equals F over Q. You times Q up to the other side, and that found you an F value, and then you store that as letter B. Uh, then you took F and made it equal to MA, and you divided both sides by M to get A by itself, and you store that as letter C. If you did it step by step with numbers the whole way, look, that, that's fine, it's sufficient, but I really want to encourage you, ma manipulate all of your formulas if you can. It's a it's a much uh, stronger process of trying to show your work. So, Okay, hopefully that made sense, because um, I'm going to move on to my next example. We're getting close to the end here. Uh, we're actually going to do the exact same thing now, but we're going to use conservation of energy principles. Okay? In this previous example, we would have used the principle 1 of accelerated motion. That was the major physics principle we used. And the reason we use that is because we ultimately use this formula here, F equals MA. But we could also use physics principle number five or four or whatever it is, the one that's uh, conservation of energy. Let me show you how we could do that. The, uh, one of the formulas that we have is that um, 
the voltage is equal to the change in energy over charge. However, we could write out a formula for change in energy. The change in energy that we're going to have is going to be all kinetic energy. Because really, the change in energy will be kinetic energy um, final minus kinetic energy initial. But since it had no initial kinetic energy, really, it started at rest, right? It started at rest. So really, the energy that's going to be changed is going to happen in the form of potential. That's what we're, it's going to happen in the form of kinetic. We are going to convert our potential to kinetic, and so we are going to gain kinetic energy. And really, this velocity here will be velocity final. So now watch this. This is super cool. I'm going to now isolate for Vf. So to do that, I'm going to take V and times by Q, and then there's a 1 half right here, so I'm also going to times that by 2. It gets rid of the 1 half. I'm going to divide by m, and I'm going to square root the whole thing. And look, I now have velocity final again. And isn't that the exact same formula that I came up with back here? 2 times vq over m. Here it is again. 2 times vq over m. So hopefully I didn't lose you with the algebra there, but I times q up over here. The 1 half I kind of times by 2, and I put a 2 up over here. Divide by mass and square root. And there, there's no point in me doing the exact same work a second time, because I've actually shown you in two different methods how it's going to work. You just have to understand that if your velocity initial was 0, that means your kinetic energy initial was 0. So therefore, your change in kinetic energy will literally just be your kinetic energy final. And so I can just use 1 half mv squared right here to solve. OK, same deal as always. If that didn't make sense, pause the video. Ask me for some help. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to give one last example here. Um, and I'm actually not going to solve this one. I'm just going to walk you through how to solve it, because that's more important. You don't need me to do all the math calculations for you. If I'm doing all the math calculations for you and doing all that little algebra step, I'm, I'm really robbing you of trying that. What I have to do is I have to show you how you solve the puzzle. And so I've got another example here where I'm going to ask you to find the electron's velocity when it only has to move one centimeter away from the negative plate. So what's going to change here is that um, in this picture right here, let's just erase some stuff. It's the same process. It's just it's only going to here. It's only going that far, one centimeter. Keep in mind, it was four centimeters the whole way, but now we're only going one centimeter. So the distance we're going to travel will be a little different. So um, I've actually got on the next slide kind of the process by which you'd solve this. And in this particular example, I actually did do all the little math steps along the way. I do think that it's better if you can like put all the formulas together. So I'm going to do that on the next slide. I just want to point out how this would work again. You would then take your voltage over your distance and solve for a field strength, because you have a voltage and a distance. You would then take your field strength and times it by charge, which it was an electron, so one elementary charge, and get a force. Once you have a force, you would put it into F equals MA, divide by the mass of the electron to get an acceleration, and then plug it into this formula here to get a final velocity. However, there's one big difference here. Remember how in the first example the distance is canceled? Well, this distance right here is the distance between the plates, and so it has to remain 4 centimeters. However, in this new example, the distance that it traveled was only 1 centimeter, so we actually have different distances. If you wanted to know the process without doing all the little formula steps there and like doing all the micro calculations along the way, the formula that we should have used would be this one right here. We would just have to keep track of which distance is which. I know we canceled them in one of them, but this distance right here would be the 1 centimeter distance, and this distance right here would be the 4 centimeter distance. That's all. So hopefully that makes sense there, but it's the exact same process of merging all these formulas together. And so um, that, that's my last example. I think we're finished after this one. So I'm not actually solving this one for you. I just want to show you how the puzzle was solved with a slight tweak. You just got to keep this distance here separate from this distance here if the electron isn't traveling the whole distance between the plate. If it's only going a partial amount of that distance, then it changes the math a little bit.
Okay, um, my run time is basically 55 minutes, so that's about what I'm shooting for. I usually shoot for an hour or less. So rewind the video, relook this over if you need to, but most importantly, um, ask me for help. Okay, I want you to learn how to do things a little bit on your own. That's a really valuable skill. The idea of being able to watch a YouTube video and, and kind of learn at your own rate. But you're not by yourself yet. You still have me as a teacher. So, uh, so, so ask me for help. Uh, there are definitely spots in here where I can imagine that you've got questions. Ask them. Please ask them. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll chat soon. Okay, thanks everybody.